Good morning, dear family. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, how wonderful it is on this Lord's Day. We serve a risen Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to read Matthew 28, verses 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Stand together and sing Christ Arose. It's number 357. The words are overhead. Oh, man. And he lives. 
says in Matthew, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said, let's sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today, number 367. Turn to those around you and say, he is risen. He is risen indeed.
that can set a heart free. He is the life that we long for. He is the answer to all that. He is, he is risen. Wow, kids, hey, that was awesome. Choir. Who's, who's had a good time so far this morning? We're here to worship the Lord. We're here to gather together. It is, it is Easter Sunday. It is Resurrection Sunday. We're excited, are you? Amen. How many of you guys got to get some goodies across the way? If you didn't, go back afterwards and grab some and check out the photo booth. You want to take a nice picture because it's not every day that we wear these kind of clothes around here at TFB. Uh, so, yeah, um, but God is good. I'm going to ask the band to come up while I do these announcements and get themselves ready. Um, just a couple of things. If you're visiting with us, we want you to fill out one of those connection cards in the pew in front of you. Let us know your information so we can, we can uh, reach out to you and let you know what's going on here at TFB. We also have gifts for visitors in the back. It's a really cool coffee mug, so you're not going to want to miss that with some goodies inside. So please check that out back there in the back of the narthex or the foyer. Um, also, again, please join us across the way afterwards for some fellowship time. Uh, if you are uh, wanting to join a life group, we, we really value life groups here at TFB. We want to make sure that each person is involved in a small group, life group community where we can love and learn and live together so that we know exactly what we're supposed to do when we go out of these walls, right, to be in this world. And that's what life groups really are for. So there's signups over there across the way as well for those of you who want to join a life group for a four-week series that begins next week called What is the Gospel? Right? It's what we need to know so that we can know it for sure so we can share it with others. Also, put uh, save the date on for our all-church work day that we're going to be having on April 20th, 8.30 to 12 p.m. We want to make sure this campus is beautiful. Uh, for, for those of us that are here, we want to be good stewards of what God has given us. So come out on that day. There'll be refreshments as well on that day. Um, so God bless you guys. Stay tuned for lots more stuff coming up. But right now, we're going to have to turn it over to the band to let them continue to lead us in worship. Great, thank you, Jared. And uh, good morning. Is there, is there joy in the house of the Lord today? Yes. We're going to sing that. Go ahead and stand up and join us. We worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore 
with the raging sea. Our God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out Your praise.
just uh, thinking about that from Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and into today where we celebrate your um, raising from the dead and that you're now even high and lifted up. And uh, just uh, guide us as we uh, listen, have, have our hearts be open to what you have to say to us tonight, today. And we'll thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, one more time. He is risen. What an amazing morning we've had so far of worship, of being able to gather together as the body of Christ. Thank you for joining us today on this Easter Sunday. Uh, the Lord stopped the storm for us for a hot second, so we're praising God for that. I want to ask you a question as we begin our time in His Word today. question is this, what is the most valuable thing that you own? the most valuable thing that you own. Is it that mint condition Honus Wagner baseball card? Nobody in here owns one of those, do they? How about that vintage 1962 Ferrari GTO that you got sitting in your garage? Nobody owns that? Okay, your cousin does, awesome. How about that Rembrandt portrait of John Six, the most expensive privately owned piece of artwork in the world? You guys don't have those things, right? No. Obviously, none of us has anything that, quote unquote, valuable. But I want to ask the question then, who decides what's valuable anyways? Who gives things their value? Who assigns value to different things? Now, I don't know about anything about cars. So, yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell a Ferrari GTO from any other kind of car at all. Some of you are like, oh, Jay, you're not a man. But anyways... Um, but I do know about baseball, and Honus Wagner was good, but man, he wasn't as good as Babe Ruth. Come on now, right? Now, I, I also know a little bit about art, although if you were to ask me to paint something for you, it might not come out so good, but I like Rembrandt, but I think a little painting uh, by a, a, little, a little guy that we know named Da Vinci called The Last Supper might be just a little more valuable than than a Rembrandt, right? But the point is not that these things are valuable, but it's what sort of value we place on these things. And, and we talk about value all the time. We make value decisions every day. We count the cost for what we deem as valuable. For me, going out to a nice meal with my family costs a gajillion dollars because I have three girls and my wife and I eat enough for two of us. So that's the value that I'm assigning. I'm willing to kind of put some, you know, extra in that just to have a, you know, come on, man, a nice ribeye, come on. Anyways, but, but we, we assign value all the time. But the most crucial decision regarding what we say is valuable, regarding the cost of something, regarding what things are worth and what we do with these things is what do we do with Jesus? How valuable is he to you and I? You see, the world doesn't always think that he's very valuable. And in fact, 2,000 years ago, they thought he was scum of the earth, and so they nailed him to one of those, right? But then three days later, what happened? He rose from the grave. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So whether we have made the decision to follow Jesus or not, that is why we are here today, right? Whether your mom or dad drug you out of bed, put some nice clothes on you, you know, said get up and get ready and let's go to church because that's what we do on Easter, or whether you're here every single Sunday and every single Wednesday and every day because I live here, right? That's what pastors do. We live at the church. Anyways, so whatever it is, that's why we're here today. We're here because there's something about this Jesus guy. There's something crazy that happened a few thousand years ago, and this guy was hung on a cross, which was a criminal's death, and he died this, this torturous way, but then this guy somehow rose from the grave, the power of God rose him up, and by the way, he's not just a guy, he's the son of God, he is our Lord, he is our Savior, Jesus Christ, the living God of all gods, amen, King Kings. That's why we're here today, and so it's a life or death decision 
This is something that we might term priceless. You guys heard that term before? Jesus is priceless. And is he worth the cost? Absolutely. Last week, we continued in our series of the gospel of the king. We moved on from the teaching of Jesus. We saw him in action. We saw him heal a leper. We saw him heal the the servant of a a Roman centurion. We saw him heal Peter's mother-in-law and many others, breaking every stereotype, every cultural norm. He reached out and touched the untouchable. By this, he demonstrated his compassion, but also the power of the kingdom of God. And this week, we aren't skipping to the end of Matthew. Although, have no fear, we will, and we've already talked about the resurrection. But we're going to continue in Matthew chapter 8 as Jesus reveals what it costs to follow him. But he proves undoubtedly that he is worth the cost. Will you join me in prayer, please? Father, we thank you. We thank you that, yes, indeed, your son, Jesus, is worth the cost that he gave everything so that we might have life, so that we might have freedom, so that we might have eternity with you. And so thank you. Thank you for sending your son. And Jesus, we thank you that you willingly, like a lamb is led before his shearers is silent. You were silent. You were led like that lamb of God to the cross. And your blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. You paid the price for me, for all of us. And you didn't stay dead, though. You rose from the grave victoriously, defeating the power of sin and of death. And so our faith is not futile. And so, Lord God, my prayer is today that you would remind us of the truth of who you are and help us to see, are you worth the cost, Lord Jesus? Spirit, empower us today to understand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, if you'll turn with me there. Please. Matthew chapter 8. You can reach in the pew in front of you. There's Bibles there if you didn't bring one. But Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 through 22. I'll be reading from the ESV this morning. It says this. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, you might be asking me at this point, Jared, why did you choose this text to preach on Easter Sunday morning? Well, because that's where we are in God's Word, and God's Word is living and active, and it's relevant for us every day in every way, and so, of course, this is an Easter message today. So what is the cost? The setting here we see in verse 18 now doesn't necessarily mean this is immediately following what we looked at last week. In fact, it almost most basically it happened the next day or two. I mean, let Jesus have at least one night of sleep, please, right? To the other side, to the other side of what it says. That's the Sea of Galilee, and this will be important as we get into the next point. But before they are able to get to that other side, Jesus is approached by an eager scribe. Okay, so what is a scribe, you ask? We hear this word thrown around a lot. The scribes are lumped up with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the experts of the law and these people who would would come to Jesus and question him and do all these kinds of crazy things that Jesus would plone them all the time. Uh, They would, uh, in fact, though, these are one who was an expert in handling written documents, Um, whatever that means. (laughs) They would teach, they would interpret, they would regulate the law. They were the experts, almost kind of like what a judge is today. These were the scribes. And this is the fourth time, mind you, that a scribe is mentioned in Matthew's gospel. You want to know what the other three times were like? Well, here you go. They don't actually paint a good picture of these scribes. In Matthew 2, 4, Herod assembles the chief priests and the scribes to ask where the Christ was to be born. And at that time, they told him, but then they showed their indifference to him because they didn't go seek out the Christ child for themselves. In Matthew 5, 20, they are used actually as a comparison of the sort of righteousness required to enter the kingdom of heaven, unlike their own self-righteousness. And then in Matthew 7, 29, they were used as a comparison to show the authoritative teaching of Jesus opposed to their own teaching, which let's just say was not 
so authoritative. Now, later on, these guys will accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Later on, they will be called hypocrites many times by Jesus. Later on, they will wrongly interpret prophecy. They will be indignant of the people's praise of Jesus at his triumphal entry. They will be part of the unjust trial of Jesus, and they will mock him at the cross, saying in Matthew 27, 42, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and then we will believe in him. Now, why bring all of this up? Because this interaction between Jesus and a scribe is not what we might expect. This scribe isn't indifferent, seemingly isn't a hypocrite or self-righteous. He doesn't call Jesus a blasphemer. He doesn't put Jesus on trial. He doesn't mock him, etc., etc. What does he do? He calls him teacher. He recognizes the authority of Jesus and he wants to follow him. Although full disclosure... There are others who call him that with no desire to follow him at all. And so this Jesus replies in this way. Yes, awesome, please come follow me. I can't wait to have a scribe on my band of brothers. Okay, you got it, right? He didn't say that, does he? What does he say? He says something really, really strange. Really cryptic, if you will. He says this, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man is a homeless vagabond with no place to lie his head. The Son of Man doesn't even have a house to lay down in. The Son of Man has no property even to call his own. So why in the world would you want to follow me, he's saying. Don't think that because you follow me, I'm just going to give you that, you know, $295 million mansion on the coast of Florida. Oh, yeah, by the way, that's the most valuable piece of property in the United States of America. Don't think that. Right? (laughs) That's not what this is about, right? In all seriousness, those who wish to follow Jesus needed to be prepared to deal with a life not necessarily of comfort and ease, but even sometimes full of discomfort and and hardship. In essence, Jesus was asking if the scribe knew what he was getting into. Commentator Robertson said, the king and his followers would be pilgrims with their citizenship in heaven with no place on earth to call home. Now in John 15, 18 through 19, Jesus tells his disciples, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Okay, but you say that's, that's the disciples, right? Those are those like 12 really special guys, you know, minus the one who betrayed him. Um, that, that Jesus rose up and then even called them apostles. They had this special calling from God. Most of them would die as martyrs. That's not surely what Jesus is asking of, of me, right? Okay, well, Paul says in Philippians 3, 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So Paul looks at his former life and all his old stuff and says, that is rubbish compared to Christ and even the suffering of Christ, right? Okay, but that's Paul. Like, come on. Paul's like Superman <laughs> apostle, right? He, he, he's like got this special calling from God. God appeared to him on the road to Damascus, blinded him, opened his eyes, and of course, Paul can you know, do all things, be all things for all men, right? Okay. Paul goes on to say to this church in Philippi, and by extension then to you and I, the church universal, he says in Philippians 3, 20 through 21, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now, some of us in this room have gone through quite a transformation today in our, you know, our look, if you will, right? 
Do you know how hard it is to tie a bow tie, y'all? It's the hardest thing in the world to do. I'm sorry, but anyways. Uh, but, but that's not, obviously, that's a silly example of a transformation, but, but there's really this, this transformation that, that happens, and if everything were perfect, this side of glory, then we wouldn't even need to be transformed. There wouldn't need to be a change in our lives whatsoever, right? But because we live in a fallen world and deal with a fallen people, that's me too, by the way, we will struggle, we will suffer. There will always be sin that we have to battle against, right? Jesus died to free us from that, but he still calls us over and over again to put it to death to take it off, to remove it, to not gratify the desires of the flesh, but rather the desires of the Spirit. Okay. All right. Back to the question. Was this man really, really wanting to follow Jesus? Now, let me point out that Jesus in this moment uses his favorite title for himself. He calls himself the Son of Man. This is the title found in Daniel 7, 13 through 14, which says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man and he came to the ancient of days, that's God the Father, and was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. You know, this scribe would have surely known that reference that Jesus was making using this title. He was an expert in the law. Later, when Jesus used the title in a more formal setting, guess what they did? They accused him of blasphemy. Okay. Interestingly, though, at this time, the scribe is silent. We hear nothing from him. He, he, he makes no reply. Now, perhaps this is because his pride has been shot and he now walks away because he realizes that he didn't even recognize this man as the son of man, which he should have. I don't know. Or perhaps he actually decides that it is worth the cost and he drops everything and he follows him. We don't know at this point in time. And I think there's a reason for that. How many of you like to know all the answers? Come on, let's be honest. I want to know them yesterday, right? I don't want to walk around in the dark, blindly stumbling around, trying to figure stuff out. I want to know what's going on, and, and, but the, the thing is we don't. And Jesus leaves things open so that we do what? Seek him so that we depend upon him. That's the point here. Was that scribe willing to do that without knowing what the end would bring? And so then we move on to another uh, person. Matthew moves on to another one of Jesus' disciples who presumably have heard what awaits one who follows him. This disciple, most likely not one of the 12, asks if he might go first and bury good old dad, right? Does that seem like an unreasonable request? Like, we, you know, if our family dies, we want to have a funeral service. We want to bury them, right? We want to You know, we call it celebration of of life, right? Most scholars say this meant, though, however, that he wanted to go and actually live with um, for an extended amount of time and see to his father's care until he died. But even if that's the case, that doesn't sound unreasonable, right? We want to make sure our parents are cared for as they get older in age, right? Uh, You know, grandmas and grandpas out there, you're like, yes, please, (laughs) right? Um, Okay doesn't seem unreasonable. But again, there's another cryptic statement by Jesus. What does Jesus say? He says, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Okay, what is that? Now, on surface, this might seem that Jesus is anti-family in any way. But this is where we need to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Later, in Matthew chapter 15, which we will get into Oh, let's see, sometime, maybe by the end of the year, I don't know. Jesus will chide the Pharisees and the scribes for finding loopholes in the law so as not to honor their fathers and their mothers, thus upholding the fifth commandment, which is what? You guys know it? Honor your father and your... Okay, good, good. All right, I was just testing you. Um, So what does Jesus then mean by this? Leave the dead to bury their dead. Don't honor your fathers and don't, don't do that. 
See, the disciple was hesitant. He said, I have this social obligation, which, by the way, he has no idea how long this is going to last, right? And, 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 and takes, it takes priority over following Jesus. And what, is, what Jesus is asking is for complete allegiance to himself. Right? It should be him first, then all the other stuff, church and, and biological family and all that other jazz, right? Jesus is not saying to dishonor your father and your mother, but what he is saying is that to follow him, you must put him above everything else. In Luke chapter 14, 25 through 33, Jesus will expound upon this teaching. He uses examples from the family, from engineering, for all my engineering nerds, I know there's quite a few of you out there. Can I get a whoop? whoop? No, never mind. <laughs> right? Uh, it comes from engineering, and everyone's favorite, politics. Don't worry, I'm not getting political on you today. The news gives us enough of that crap. Oh, I'm sorry. I will simply read it and let it speak for itself. Here you go, Luke 14, 25 through 33. Now, great crowds accompanied him. Huh, go figure, more crowds, right? And he turned and said to them, you ready for mind blown? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Okay. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, that one looks pretty. Didn't look like that on that day. For which one of you, here's the, the engineering one, here we go. For which one of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it, Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying that man began to build and was not able to finish, or even worse, that he finished it on the wrong kind of land, and now you have, what, the leaning tower of Pisa. And here's the politics. Or what a king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who come against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace, right? Unless you really think your 10,000 or your 300 is bigger than the other army, I don't know, right? So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. <laughs> Again, doesn't sound like an Easter message today, does it? According to Doriani, this disciple calls Jesus Lord, but he offers himself conditionally. Jesus implies that this sort of disciple is not really a disciple at all, but is still numbered among the dead. See, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul tells the church at Corinth, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Again, notice, no recorded response from the disciple. We are left to complete the story ourselves. Now, why are these two accounts given here? What is this all about? Why are, these, why are these given right after these wonderful, amazing miracles that Jesus does? And we're going to see another one in a second. First, remember that there are crowds surrounding him. Why are they there? Is it, are they there because they truly believe that he's the Messiah? Are they there because they are ready to give their lives to follow after him? Why are they there? Maybe there's a few that are there for that, but for the most part, they are there because they're attracted to the miracles themselves. They're attracted to the signs as Scripture talks about them, right? They want to see this dog and pony show, right? They're excited. How many of us have ever bought into some kind of dog and pony show in this world and been like, oh, I'm going to follow after this guy because, whew, that's awesome, okay? 
O'Donnell said, but so different than most celebrities today, Jesus is not interested in drawing a crowd. He's not interested in having people follow him. He's interested in having followers. Jesus wanted to make people sure that they understood that following him is not some dog or pony show. It is not about waiting around until the next miracle happens. It is not about social media friends or the amount of likes you receive on a post. Maybe that hits a little closer to home. It's about surrendering one's life to the king, even if it means that will cost you. Okay, come on, PJ. All this talk, all this talk about the cost of discipleship has me ready to run for the hills or at least run for the door right now. How many of you are like, I'm out of here. I don't want any part of this. Why should I buy into Jesus if it's going to cost me so much? Let me tell you why. Because he's worth the cost. Unequivocally, absolutely worth the cost. Let me share with you what happens next. Let's continue. Verse 23 through 27. And so finally he gets into the boat, right? And when he got into the boat, his disciples, it says, followed him and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and they woke him saying, save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? See, after dealing with the interruption, Jesus and his disciples are able to follow the orders that he gave. And they, uh, back in verse 18, they go to the other side. As we know, they do this by boat. But this wasn't some Sunday afternoon smooth sailing across the Sea of Galilee. Arthur Robertson said, Frequent sudden storms stirred the Sea of Galilee when cold air from Mount Hermon rushed down and clashed with the warm air at water level. I wrote here, what sort of clash is going on outside right now? Nothing. Okay, but anyways, if anybody was awake last night, whoo, like the world was ending. Uh, Amy said the house was like shaking because of how windy and stuff it was. And this here on the Sea of Galilee, it says, was a great storm. Did you know the Greek word for great storm is the word seismos? Seismos. Does that sound like anything we know, any of our words that we might use? Oh, seismic. Literally what happened to the sea was a violent, shaking earthquake of a storm. It might be kind of like what I felt a few years back. I was in Ohio. I might have shared this story before for a pastor's conference. And it just so happened that during this time, there were actual water spout warnings, which what's a water spout? It's like a wet tornado. (laughs) Uh, And uh, the, the people at the conference were saying, hey, if you want to hunker down in our basement, you can hunker down here for the night. And I was like, no, I got to get back to my hotel, la, 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 la. And so little me in my little red rented Fiat, (laughs) decides to trek back from Chagrin Falls, which is like the suburbs, all the way almost back to Cleveland, a little town called Independence, Ohio. Boy, did I feel my independence when that trip was over. But anyways, (laughs) lightning, water spouts, this little rented Fiat, GPS, by the way, at that time, GPS was not what it was today. I had to pull off the freeway. I had to sit there and figure out where am I going, and I'm praying the whole time, white-knuckling it. By the time I got back to the hotel, I couldn't even move my hands off the steering wheel. Yikes. Talk about fear. But you see, the waves crashed, and they threatened to capsize this boat, which was more like that little Fiat and not like an ocean liner, if you will. What is Jesus doing when the world around him is crumbling down, when the waves are crashing, when when the disciples are freaking out? What is he doing? Which I don't see any any one of you doing right now. 
Boy, he must be tired. The disciples, of course, are freaking out. I mean, wouldn't you be? Anybody watch the movie Perfect Storm? Don't, if you ever want to go in the ocean ever again. (laughs) What do they do? So they wake him up. Of course, Jesus, get up. Help us. We are perishing. We are dying here, Jesus. And you're sleeping? What? Almost nonchalantly, Jesus then wakes up, calls them out for their fear and lack of faith, gets up, rebukes. Literally, the word there is muzzles the storm, and immediately it calms down. Now, according to Doriani, this was a supernatural, immediate tranquility defying the norms for storms. Jesus defies all norms, does he not? Let's talk about this for a moment. Okay, why the storm in the first place? What's going on? I like what Gutsky says. He said, here we may note at once that just because you become a follower of the Lord, you need not expect everything to be sweet and lovely. Actually, deciding to follow the Lord may mean real danger. Think about what it meant for those five young men who went down to South America and were killed by a tribe, okay? Jim Elliott and friends. Think about what it meant for them. Think about what it means every day for those that are being persecuted for their faith across this world. We don't see that as much here, but it is real, friends. There are people dying for their faith in Jesus Christ. Think about what it meant for Pastor Andrew when he was in that prison for so many years in Turkey. You guys remember that story? Finally able to come home. Think about what that means. Um, Notice that Jesus, though, has no fear. Waves are crashing, winds are blowing, he's, he's sound asleep. Now, don't buy in when some say that he was just feigning sleep here, that he was like trying to test his disciples by faking that he was sleeping, right? That, that's not cool. He really was asleep. And don't buy in when some say there was no real danger from the storm. It was really a seismic storm. Doriani says this form of piety sucks the life from this drama. And so what should we buy into? We should buy into the fact that Jesus has complete faith in the Father to protect him. We should buy into the fact that Jesus also himself has complete control over the natural world like he showed last week when healing the many. Psalm 89, 8 through 9 says, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. And that's what Jesus did. He stilled the waves. He is Lord. Now contrast with that with the disciples. The disciples are afraid. Waves are crashing, winds are blowing, and they're freaking out. By the way, some of them are fishermen. They're used to this sort of weather that would pop up on the Sea of Galilee. They're used to uh, being out all night with catching nothing. They're used to these sorts of things, but yet they are even afraid because this is, again, a great storm. I would be afraid too. But notice, what does Jesus do first? Does he calm the storm? No, he speaks to them. He speaks to them directly before calming the storm. Spurgeon said, he spoke to the men first, for they were the most difficult to deal with. Wind and sea could be rebuked afterward. Oh, good old Spurgeon. Oh, man. No, Jesus says that they have little faith. He's used this before, Matthew 6.30, when he commands them to not be anxious. And remember, at that time, we said that this is not no faith, but rather something like deficient or ineffective faith. They have enough faith to wake him up because they know that he's the only person who can deal with the storm. He's the only one who can save them. But but Jesus wants something deeper for them, deeper for them. He wants them to have faith that even when he's sleeping, even when he's gone home to be with the Father in heaven, that they will not fear. They will not doubt. He wants them to trust in his very presence. And they marvel then at the fact that the winds and the seas obey him. What sort of man is this? 
what sort of man is this? They, they still don't fully grasp his identity. Stilling a storm, have you ever seen anyone do that? That's power. That's authority. He is no mere man. That's something that only God could do. But we know that he is the son of God and he has power over creation and who will bring true salvation, not just from a storm on the Sea of Galilee, but from the storm of sin and death through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. He is risen. Uh, I know you're falling asleep. In all seriousness, the question for the day is this. Is he worth the cost? For those who do not know him, for those who have not professed faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who have not renounced and repented of sin, perhaps today is the day of salvation. Yes, going to cost you something. You will have to say goodbye to your former way of life. Throw off the sin that entangles and run the race of faith that Jesus pinned in his own blood. But let me tell you, it is worth the cost. Not only does Jesus have power over the wind and the waves, but the power over sin and death. In fact, he's already defeated them because he's risen from the grave. And what he offers is so much greater, so much more valuable than anything the world can offer. Whether it is a Ferrari or a baseball card or a big mansion or some kind of painting, you can't take that with you. The only thing that lasts is our faith in Jesus Christ. And it is greater than anything this world can offer. Because Jesus offers forgiveness. Who needs to be forgiven today? Who needs the power to forgive others today? Jesus offers peace. Who needs peace today? Who needs to extend peace today? Jesus offers freedom. Jesus offers a reconciled relationship with God and with man. Jesus offers life abundant. Jesus offers life eternal. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. He's worth the cost. So if that's you today and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus and you recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and you want to give your life to Christ, may today be the day of salvation. Don't leave this room without doing business with the King of Kings. Okay, Pastor Jared, but what about all those who, who know him or perhaps think they do? Who said a prayer years ago when they were four in the backseat of their mom's car? Who might have taken seriously the things of the Lord for a season but find themselves rarely darkening the door of a church? Doubting the faith, priorities in other places, rarely in the word or in prayer. Again, church doesn't save you. I'm not saying you got to be here every single Sunday. Although you should because you want to. Rarely in the word, rarely in prayer, living a lifestyle of compromise. Perhaps you're like that eager scribe who has maybe a little touch of pride, might like what Jesus offers, might, 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 might even call him Savior, but Lord, oh, that's hard because I like to be in control of my own life. Perhaps you're like the hesitant disciple who had priorities at home, or maybe just excuses, not willing to count the cost. You see, this, this message is for you as well. Yes, it might cost you something, Jesus is calling you to a deeper walk with him further up and further in where things might be a bit uncomfortable, where you also might have to say no to some of the things of your former life, prioritizing the king and his kingdom. But as we know, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to us. But what about those who 
know him, who faithfully come to church every Sunday, who faithfully serve in, in different ministries, who might have even cast out a demon here or there. Is that any? No. but are filled with pride and self-righteousness and, and look on people in condemnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Rather than looking down on someone with condemnation, maybe we should have a conversation with them and get to know their story and share with them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which offers grace. Yes, there's a cost involved, but shares that the cost is worth it. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And if Paul wasn't following Christ, you shouldn't follow him. See, friends, we have too many examples in our world today. I'm listening to a podcast right now that doesn't paint a picture, a good picture of, of the church at all. You might be guessing what I might be listening to. You might have seen headlines in the news about certain pastors over the last few years that have fallen morally. And so when people outside the church look at that and they look at us and they say, I don't want anything that that church has to offer. They can't even live what they preach. Or maybe they're not even preaching. Maybe they're just tickling ears making us feel good. You see, God's word is truth. It's living and it's active. Yes, Jesus offers grace. Yes, God's riches at Christ's expense are available for all who would respond in faith to him. But we also have to count that cost. I haven't even mentioned why we can't afford not to follow Jesus, why we can't choose the wide road, why we can't build our houses on the sand, why we can't fix our eyes or, or, or why we shouldn't fix our eyes on Jesus. For those that do not trust in Christ for salvation, who do not believe in his shed blood upon the cross or his victorious resurrection on the third day, there is no forgiveness, there is no peace, there is no freedom from sin, there is no reconciliation with God or with man, there is no life, there is only death. And the wages of sin is death. So is he worth the cost? Absolutely, because I don't want to die eternally separated from the God of the universe who loved me so much that he sent his son to die on a torturous weapon of the Roman Empire and being betrayed by his own, gave his life so that I can have life abundant and life free in the here and now, not some pie in the sky by and by, but yes, I will get heaven one day, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. It is it worth it? Yes. Absolutely. And that's my prayer. That each of us in this room would count the cost and that we come to the end of our tally sheet. The scales would fall and Jesus would be lifted high. Amen? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, thank you for having mercy upon us. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that you have given us yourself, the sacrifice you made so that we might have life in you, life abundant and free. Lord, teach us to number the cost, to count the cost. Teach us, Lord, to surrender our lives because we know that nothing that this world offers is worth it. That our value, our value, is found only in Jesus Christ and in him crucified and risen and coming again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us as we sing our closing song together?
was the way the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon One final breath he gave as heaven looked away the Son of God was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war on death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake the storm was rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now death, where is your sting? The resurrected King Has landed in the defeated Forever He is glorified Forever the lamb that was slain worthy 
to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. He's risen. He risen God bless you watching at home. Have a great, amazing, happy Easter. Join us across the way if you want to for goodies. Take your picture, just fellowship, and enjoy being family together, serving our resurrected King Jesus. God bless you. We'll see you soon.